Okay, this is Cultural Psychology, the second chapter. We're going to talk about culture and human nature. Uh, one of the things you have to realize if you think about uh, humans and, and how long we've been around and how in the world did we survive, we're awfully weak, we're awfully wimpy, how in the world we, were we able, ever able to survive? And one of the answers you would have to come up with is the fact that we imitate each other. If we see something that is successful, we imitate it. Uh, if, if we learn that uh, by uh, talking funny and, and trying to act like Elvis, it gives us, gets us a lot of girlfriends, and then we produ produce a lot of children, uh, then that type of imitation uh, is, uh, is adaptive. Uh, and so, of course, you know, acting like Elvis is probably works for some people, but if all of us did that, it wouldn't mean anything. Uh, but uh, if we're talking about hunting, if we're talking about finding uh, food, if we're talking about finding shelter, uh, the one that, uh, if we imitated the ones that were successful, of course, then we, that is, has uh, made us the people that have been able to adapt over the eons that, that humans have been on Earth. Humans are quite particular about whom they choose to imitate. Uh, humans are said to have prestige bias. Uh, they are especially concerned with detecting who has prestige. Uh, that is, they seek others who have skills that they are, are respected by others, uh, and they try to imitate what these individuals are doing. Uh, these are Dolly Parton imitators. Uh, that's how they make their money. They look and act like Dolly Parton. These are Elvis impersonators. All of them are Elvis impersonators. Uh, it worked for them. Uh, once upon a time, uh, Pat Benatar, back in the 80s, Pat Benatar was, uh, was a singer. Uh, and there were a lot of girls that were dressing like Pat Benatar. Uh, Madonna, when she first became popular... Uh, she started wearing her underwear on the outside of her clothes, which is kind of weird. But uh, she started doing that, and then other uh, individuals would imitate her because they wanted to look and act like like Madonna. I can't think of any, any uh, more modern uh, examples. Of course, Dolly Parton is in her 70s. Elvis has been gone since, since the 70s, so here we have all these people acting like Elvis. Uh, imitating prestigious others is a very efficient way of cultural learning. Uh, individuals are more likely to learn successfully if they target those people who are especially talented. And of course, this is a young uh, Muslim. And he is learning how to uh, how to pray uh, by by imitating his elders, identifying signs of prestige, and then imitating people who displayed those signs or skills that were likely selected for in the course of human evolution. Our ancestors who did this were more likely to acquire the highly useful cultural knowledge that gave them a survival advantage compared with those who did not. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we do what we do, uh, why we uh, follow select religions, why we uh, follow uh, tri select tribal practices because this makes us successful and this has allowed us to adapt and survive uh, in, a, in a hostile environment. Humans uh, have what is known as a theory of mind. Uh, theory of mind means that people understand that others have minds that are different from their own and thus that other people have perspectives and intentions that are different from their own. Um, if you're driving down the road and somebody's driving erratically or driving fa really, really fast, uh, then probably you, you're telling yourself, I need to get out of this guy's way. If I don't get out of his way, he may hit me. Uh, I have a friend who is a Quaker, um, and I'm, I'm not denigrating. No, I guess I am to some extent. Uh, he was a Quaker, and if you've ever talked to a Quaker, if you ever tried to argue with a Quaker, they're always right, and the reason they're right is because God tells them that they're right. Um, kind of. It gets a little weird. Anyway, this guy was driving down the road, and uh, the, the, uh, he was uh, going around a, cr a curve, and the, other, the guy that was coming toward him 
was cheating. He was coming across the line. And uh, instead of pulling off the road and letting this guy go, go by, uh, this guy held his line. And by golly, he had a head-on collision with that, that individual. And everybody was killed in both cars. Uh, that's how sometimes you got to adapt to what's going on. He needed to, to see what was going on in this other person's mind. But, of course, he was the kind of an individual that liked to argue. And so he, he knew he was right. Uh, and as it turned out, he was dead right, unfortunately. And he's no longer with us. Imitative learning is where the learner copies uh, precisely what they think the model is trying to do. Emulative learning is where the learner is focused on the environmental events that are involved. The emulative learner is only focused on the events that happen around the model, not what the model intends to accomplish. In emulative learning, you learn one task but can't use the knowledge in any other context. Human cultural learning is cumulative. So we learn a select skill, and then we move on to something else, and it, and it, uh, uh, it accumulates. Cultural information grows in complexity and often in utility over time. A good example would be the use of a gear or the use of a, a wheel. Initially, it was just used to transport things. Now it's used for many different things to make... Um, various types of machines, including the ratchet. Uh, this is called the ratchet effect. Like a ratchet, it always moves forward and is not allowed to slip backward. And this is the way culture is. Cultural information, uh, we build uh, cultural information, and it never goes backwards. Well, from time to time, it will go backwards. Now, this is really kind of interesting, because if you think about life, and you think about what's going on, and and you've been around for however many years you have, uh, potentially if you were born before 1993, uh, there was no internet. Uh, but if you are, of course, uh, are we going to throw away the internet uh, because uh, there's too much pornography or whatever? Whatever, whatever the excuse is, are we going to throw away uh, that type of technology? And the answer is probably no. We're not going to do that. Cultural information can continue to accumulate without losing the earlier information. Now, there's one group of people in the United States that would like things to go back to the way they were because they feel that things were better in the past than they are in the, in the present and the future. So they want to take things back. They, and these, are, these individuals are referred to as conservatives. Conservatives, um, in England, they're called Tories. Uh, in, uh, in the United States they're referred to as conservatives. They want things to be like they were in the past because they like the way that things were before. Uh, there's another group in the United States called progressives, and progressives want things to continue to, uh, to build, to, to be better than they were before. And of course that uh, is a... Uh, those, they have become political movements in the United States. I have a brother who is a conservative, and he refers to liberals. He, 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 uh, he refers to um, uh, progressives as libtards, uh, retarded liberals. Is one of his, his idea. Uh, he's very. He's a very brilliant individual. So you know, if he wants to call somebody retarded, I guess he can do that. I guess he can do that if he wants to, but uh, the reality, of course, of course is that, that uh, life keeps moving forward, it never goes backwards, and really, you shouldn't hope for things being like they were in the past, because it will never happen. It just doesn't work that way. To have, a cumulative, to have cumulative cultural evolution, you need creative invention, reliable and faithful social transmission, uh, high fidelity social transmission requires accurate imitative learning and sophisticated communication. And of course, as a re as a researcher in psychology, one of the things that you do is that you publish so that people will learn what you learn. And of course, that is referred to as faithful social transmission. High fidelity social transmission. We use journal articles. That's how science progresses. It keeps moving. 
that keeps moving in a positive direction. No species but humans have shown these capacities for high fidelity social transmission. The larger the group of people, the better cultural information can be maintained and improved upon. Uh, you're more likely to encounter a successful model to copy from uh, out of a larger group than out of a smaller group. And this is one of the reasons why cities and uh, large countries are considered more progressive than small countries and, and towns or rural areas. There will be more innovations that come from a larger group than from a smaller group, so a larger group will be more likely to have at least one person stumble on a good idea. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, why uh, places like New York City and London and Tokyo are innovative, are seen as innovative. Uh, somebody who has a good idea will move to the city uh, in order uh, to become successful. That's the idea. They rarely move to, you know, Lost Nation, Iowa, in order uh, to, to cure cancer. It just doesn't work that way. Looking at the Polynesians settling in the South Pacific, the islands with the largest populations at the time of first contact had far more di uh, different kinds of tools than the islands with the smallest populations. Bigger populations allowed for, for the more rapid spread of cultural innovations. And if we look at all of these islands in the South Pacific, we have Hawaii, which had a relatively large population. Fiji had a relatively large population. New Caledonia, uh, Vanuatu, uh, the Solomon Islands. Uh, these, all of these places had uh, relatively large populations. And because of that, they tended to have more, uh, more tools. However, sometimes a ratchet, a ratchet slips and a population will lose ideas. This happened with the Aboriginal uh, population that inhabited Tasmania from the Australian mainland. And this is Australia. This mass right here is Australia. Uh, oddly enough, Australia is considered a continent. It's a, actually an island, but we won't go into that. This is Tasmania down here. This red thing down here is Tasmania. And the Aborigines, there were lots of Aborigines that lived in Australia and they moved to Tasmania. And once they got to Tasmania, things didn't progress. They, as a matter of fact, they went backwards. When the Europeans initially arrived in Tasmania, they found scattered foraging bands of humans utilizing the simplest technology. Archaeological digs have shown that the technology seen in their past was far more advanced than what was demonstrated in their current technology. So the Tasmanians actually went backwards. Comparing the Tasmanian Aborigines with those across the, the Bass uh, Strait in Australia, the, the Tasmanians maintained a toolkit of only 24 items, whereas the Australians maintained a toolkit of hundreds of items. And of course, these were the same people. One uh, had uh, one group had moved to Tasmania, and once they got there, they forgot everything. They didn't pass things on, and of course, eventually. Uh, they ended up with, with only 24 to, uh, tools in their toolkit, whereas the Aborigines who lived on Australia uh, had hundreds of, of items in their toolkit. The Tasmanians had lost bone tools, uh, cold weather clothing, uh, fish hooks, and they had lost boomerangs. Now, interestingly, uh, well, let me see, okay. Uh, oh, we saw that Tasmania is actually farther south. Well, they're uh, the equator is up here. Uh, so the Tasmanians, it's actually colder on, ta uh, on the ta Tasmanian uh, island than uh, it is in Australia, especially up in the northern portion. If you know anything about, uh, about Australia, it gets cold there in the wintertime, and these individuals lost their cold weather clothing. So I imagine some of them froze to death at various uh, times uh, because of their lack of clothing. Other groups where the ratchet seems to have slipped uh, included uh, the uh, Melanesians of the Torres Islands north of Australia, their reclusive Soriano of uh, Bolivia, and I apologize, uh, these people are naked, uh, but they are primitive people. They lost, uh, they lost, uh, evidently they lost the concept of clothing. The Paraha of uh, the reclusive 
Paraha of Brazil, and of course they are naked as well. They don't wear correct clothing either. Uh, but they're of course on the equator. Humans are, are a cultural species that exists within worlds consisting of cultural information that has accumulated over history. Cultural ideas uh, greatly influence the ways that we live our lives, determining much of what we do on a daily basis. We are all born into rich cultural worlds and we are constantly learning and being influenced by the shared ideas that make up our culture. Our brain size is determined by the encephalization quotient, uh, the ratio of the brain weight of, of an animal to that predicted for a comparable animal of the same body size. If you've ever seen a deer, uh, deers have a relatively large body. They weigh well over 200 pounds but their heads are really, really small. Uh, but of course they've been able to survive because they're so fast. Uh, they are paranoid. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you make a noise around a deer, the deer takes off. Uh, they don't need a big brain, evidently. But us as humans, of course, we do need a big brain and that's what we have evolved. We've evolved uh, to have a big brain. For humans, it is 4.6, or that we have a four to five times larger brain than another mammal of our size. Only the tiny but big brain shrew has a, has a higher ratio than humans, and they maintain a brain that accounts for 10% of their body weight. Our brains consume about 16% of our basal metabolism, even though our brains only represent 2% of our body weight. The brain of the average mammal only consumes about 3% of their ba basal metabolism. We as humans, 16%. The brain of the marsupial uh, only consumes 1% of their basal metabolism. This is a possum. I, I grew up with possums. Uh, yeah, they are pretty, uh, they're not real bright. Uh, so if you've never seen one, this is what a possum looks like. The possum is the only marsupial that lives in North America. Uh, but almost all the animals on Australia, surprisingly, are marsupials, including the kangaroo and the wallaby. And the koala. Koala is a marsupial as well. In order to maintain the massive human brain, the trade-off was shrinkage in other areas. The chimpanzee muscles are 27% larger than humans. Don't ever get in a wrestling match with a chimpanzee. He will kick your butt. Uh, but our guts, of course, we have 27% uh, smaller muscles, but our guts, our stomach, and our small and large intestines are about 60% smaller than that of the chimpanzee. As you can see, his gut is fairly protruding, and as humans, we don't have much of a gut at all. One reason humans were able to reduce their digestive needs is because we were able to learn to do more of our digestion outside of our bodies. In other words, we started cooking our food. Once we started using fire to cook our food, uh, we were able to change the uh, structure of the food, so we were able to get the nutrition from the food uh, without expending a lot of energy. Cooking substantially increases the amount of energy that can be extracted from food. It denatures protein, so it breaks down the protein so that we can digest it and we can utilize it, and it gelatinizes starch. It makes all foods softer and easier to digest, thus requiring less energy. And as an example, because of cooking, humans are able to consume foods that cannot be eaten raw. This reduced the amount of chewing necessary to consume food, reducing the amount of muscle required in the human jaw. It also changed the shape of our teeth. This, these are human teeth, and these are the teeth of a great ape. As you can see, uh, their front teeth is used for biting and tearing, and this is how they mash up their food. All of our teeth, are we don't really have teeth uh, to, to rip and tear like the uh, great ape does. Uh, almost all of ours uh, is to chew, is to consume. But then again, what are, we, uh, what are we chewing? We're chewing food that is much, much softer uh, than the food, uh, than the raw food that the uh, great ape has to consume. The average human spends about one hour chewing their food a day. Uh, the average chimpanzee spends about six hours chewing their food. By cooking our food, we are able to evolve 
uh, a much smaller digestive tract, which freed up much energy to be used by our brains. And as we saw before, uh, our guts are 60% smaller than the chimpanzee gut. Many primates eat a lot of fruit. Uh, if you've ever been to the monkey house, uh, they feed them fruit, and that, that's what that's all they eat. Uh, uh, not just bananas, of course. They eat, uh, they eat all kinds of fruit. There are good reasons to eat fruit. Uh, it's got it's rich in vitamins. It has lots of carbohydrates, and it has lots of calories. And fruits tend to be available in concentrated patches. Uh, I would talk. I would brag about my apple trees, but uh, unfortunately. Uh, we had late frost and I didn't get very many apples. What apples we did have, uh, the windstorm blew them off when they were green. So we lost almost all of our fruit, as sad as that is. But fruit grow on trees. So when your apples uh, will uh, mature, uh, you could sit there and eat apples for, for two or three weeks off of one apple tree. Uh, and of course, bananas are the same way. Uh, peaches, plums, uh, pears, uh, whatever it is, strawberries, cherries grow on trees and bushes. Uh, you know, all of these are are fruits that you could uh, you could consume and get a lot of energy from. To live off of a diet of fruit, you need to, to keep in mind where the various fruit trees are located and when they would likely be bearing ripe fruit. Perhaps the greater need for a good memory and a big brain was triggered by the need to remember fruit locations. And this is a an apple tree, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it looks like an apple tree. It's lost most of its apples. Those are the ones that are are left over, <laughs> it looks like. Those primate, primates uh, that had better skills at remembering where the fruit uh, was fruit was would have been more likely to eat well and to have surviving offspring than those who were stumbling about aimlessly trying to find ripe pawpaws. And this is what a pawpaw looks like, as weird as that is. We had pawpaws in Indiana. Uh, I found them, they, they're kind of like slimy bananas, is what they taste like. I'm, I'm, I'm not a real fan of slimy bananas or pawpaws. A number of primate species rely on food sources that uh, require a fair bit of ingenuity to access them. Uh, some primates' food sources include nuts and seeds encased in hard shells, tubers that need to be dug up, termites that need to be fished out of termite mounds. Extractive food sources such as the ones uh, just mentioned are often worth pursuing because they are rich in protein and, of course, they give you energy because of the protein and the sugar. Those primates who were able to extract nutritious foods were more likely to survive and produce viable offspring. Most primates live in complex social groups maintaining clear power hierarchies allowing them to form various relationships and alliances. Conflicts as well as cooperation, nepotism, and reciprocity. Why in the world did I put that picture in there? That is not right. I have no idea. These are certainly primates of course uh, and as humans, we were the, at the top of the primate uh, hierarchy. Humphrey and Dunbar have hypothesized that it was, uh, it was the necessity to navigate through the intricate and elaborate webs of social relationships. Uh, the, more in the more intelligent the primate, the more intricate the hierarchy that you have to, the, the, uh, the more important the, the social structure. So as primates, of course, we have to navigate through intricate and elaborate webs of social relationships. Uh, we need to attract a mate. We need to secure resources and protect them, uh, protect themselves and their offspring from uh, from other primates. They led to the this the, the led to the development of a, of the uh, big brain, and of course that's what's going. This is actually a. Um, uh, this is a marriage dance, is what it is. And so they are attracting a mate who will take care of them and allow their offspring to survive as well. But of course we can look at a uh, more uh, complex society. Um, one of the reasons we do the things that we do, that we act the way that we do, uh, is to be able to uh, uh, reproduce and to have offspring that uh, that survive 
and the more light if, if we adhere ourselves uh, to a um, uh, to a significant other uh, males who if they uh, will uh, attract a, f a female that uh, will give birth to viable offspring uh, if a female will attract a mate who will protect them and uh, is able to produce offspring that are viable uh, they are more likely to uh, project their progeny into the future and of course uh, you can go back to a, a more primitive society this is, these are bushmen of the Kalahari Desert uh, these individuals do it and these individuals did exactly the same thing that the bushmen did in order for them to survive they have to do the things that they do they wear their hair in the way that they wear their hair uh, they pair bond uh, in order to reproduce uh, and of course they try to support their offspring so that their offspring will survive it's why we do the things that we do it's why we act the way that we do it's why we dress the way that we do we are trying to uh, survive for the future Dunbar analyzed the relationship between neocortex ratio and average group size and estimated that the average size of the human ancestral population was 147.8. In other words, uh, each village uh, could maintain about uh, 150 people. So looking at subsistence societies still in existence, Dunbar discovered that the average clan size was 148.4. So we're, we're talking about 150 people is about the, the, uh, about the size that you can actually uh, interact with. Uh, just only 150 people. If it's larger than that, it becomes too unwieldy. If it's smaller than that, then you potentially are not going to survive. In 2011, Facebook did a survey of its accounts and found that the average number of friends that people had was between 120 and 130. I'm no longer on Facebook, but when I was on Facebook, guess how many friends I had? Somewhere in the range of 120 to 130, as weird as that sounds. The same year, Twitter analyzed their accounts and discovered that people could maintain between 100 and 200 interactions. And these are people that you interact with that interact back with you. Any groups that are larger than 150 become too unwieldy to manage without some institutional structure, yet smaller groups lose their advantages of larger numbers. Although primates are highly social mammals, in many ways humans can be said to be an ultra-social species. Humans tend to be far more engaged with others around them than uh, do any other primates. We are constantly attending to what others are doing. Uh, we gossip about others all the time. Our behaviors are guided a uh, guided a group deal uh, by what others uh, are guided a great deal by what others around us are doing. We learn by imitating others, and of course, why do we wear the clothes that we wear? Uh, why do we act the way that we act? Why do we have hairstyles that are so very similar as we saw before? Why in the world do they do that? Why do they have hairstyles that are all the same? Why is everybody wearing black tie? Uh, why are the women dressed the way that they are? And as you can see, they, everybody has the same, every, all these females have the same hairstyle. But let's not just pick on the women. Look at this. All these men have slick back hair. Slick back hair. Even this old guy over his hair has got grease in it too, and so does his, of course. Now, if we look at this other group, they're all wearing some kind of band around their head. Most of them are. All the adults are, certainly. Uh, they're wearing some kind of a band around their head. They're also wearing a belt. This is a. This is actually their, their passing food back and forth. This is a melon, as strange as that may seem. Why do we do all these things? Why do, why do, this used to drive me crazy. Uh, Navajos wear dark clothes all the time. It seems like you guys are running around trying to be ninjas. I'm just 
I guess that's not very nice, but um, I, I would, uh, and, and I would make that statement in class. Uh, I would say, oh, look, look at what everybody's wearing. And everybody would have on black or gray uh, clothing. Uh, and I would, of course, be wearing a Hawaiian shirt or something, uh, marking me as, as separate and different. An experiment, uh, in an experiment by Dean et al. in 2012, the researchers compared the ability of a chimpanzee and orangutan, this is an orangutan, and this is a chimpanzee, uh, they compared them versus a two-and-a-half-year-old to solve a physical problem and a social problem, and this is a two-and-a-half-year-old, and this is a two-and-a-half-year-old. The child and the great apes performed equally, e equally well on the physical problem at about 75 percent. They were all three of them, the chimpanzee, the two-and-a-half-year-old, and the orangutan, were able to solve the problem at about a 75 percent clip. So they all got C's on that one. However, for the social problem, when the subjects had to follow a model, the two-and-a-half-year-olds were more likely to follow precisely what the model did. The great apes tried to solve the, prob the social problem through emulation. Most of the humans scored 100% on the social problem, while most of the apes scored a 0%. So the apes, uh, the uh, orangutan, and the, uh, the uh, chimpanzees got, got Fs uh, for their uh, endeavor, and uh, the uh, children, uh, the two-and-a-half-year-olds, got 87.5%, which is a B plus. So the kids passed, and the, and the great apes flunked. So no matter how reclusive an individual or a group of humans are, culture and the biology of the human brain are bound inextricably. Humans evolved to be a cultural species. And here we have all these individuals wearing exactly the same paint and dancing probably in the same way. And as you can see, this guy's painted blue as well. But they, these guys are blue and red. These are, uh, these are aborigines from... Uh, from Brazil, and they are tattooed. Their legs, I think their legs are tattooed. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, this guy's got glasses on and flip flops. <laughs> anyway, so we imitate. We imitate each other. We are a very cultural species, and that is the end of chapter two. So, uh, you guys stay safe. Uh, I'll see you next week, uh, and I'll probably say something else. Uh, equally stupid to what I said 